My brothers and sisters, may the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm and has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The Gospel of the Lord. We celebrate today, of course, the Feast of the Assumption of Mary, and then one of the first churches that was dedicated to Mary is in an area outside of Rome, in Rome, called Trastevere, Santa Maria in Trastevere. And it was built in the fourth century, so in the 300s there already was a church that was given over to the remembrance of Mary. And in the mosaics on the front of the church, there's a little segment of the mosaic which shows a tomb filled with flowers and just her feet up above, as if she's been raised up out of it. And so already by the third century, uh, people were having this belief and this conviction that because of the unique role she played in the plan of salvation history, she would undergo herself a very different way in comparison to the rest of us. Not that all of us have the same pledge by reason of the fact that ultimately we too can have eternal life. In the Office of Readings this morning, there is a segment from Pope Pius XII's Munificentibus Deus, which was done in 1950, where the Church kind of formally proclaimed what had been the belief from the very beginning. Pope Pius says, In their homilies and sermons on this feast, the Holy Fathers and great doctors spoke of the assumption of the Mother of God as something already familiar and accepted by the faithful. They gave it greater clarity in their preaching and used more profound arguments in setting out its nature and meaning. Above all, they brought out more clearly the fact that what is commemorated in this feast is not simply the total absence of corruption from the dead body of the Blessed Virgin Mary, but also her triumph over death and her glorification in heaven after the pattern set by her only Son, Jesus Christ. Thus, St. John Damascene, preeminent as the great preacher of this truth of tradition, speaks with powerful eloquence when he relates the bodily assumption of the loving mother of God to her other gifts and privileges. He says, it was necessary that she who had preserved her virginity inviolate in childbirth should also have her body kept free from all corruption after death. It was necessary that she who had carried the creator as a child on her breast should dwell in the tabernacles of God. It was necessary that the bride espoused by the father should make her home in the bridal chambers of heaven. It was necessary that she who had gazed on her crucified son and been pierced in the heart by the sword of sorrow, which she had escaped in giving him birth, should contemplate him seated with the father. It was necessary that the mother of God should share the possessions of her son and be venerated by every creature as the mother and the handmaid of God. Saint Germanus of Constantinople considered that it was in keeping not only with her divine motherhood, but also with the unique sanctity of her virginal body that it was incorrupt and carried up to heaven. In the words of scripture, you appear in beauty. Your virginal body is entirely holy, entirely chaste, entirely the house of God, so that for this reason also it is henceforth a stranger to decay, a body changed, because a human body to a preeminent life of incorruptibility 
but still a living body, excelling in splendor, a bodily inviolate and sharing the perfection of life. And yet another early author declares, therefore as the most glorious mother of Christ, our God and savior, giver of life and immortality, she is enlivened by him to share an eternal incorruptibility of body with him who raised her from the tomb and took her up to himself in a way he alone can tell. Hence the august mother of God, mysteriously united from all eternity with Jesus Christ in one and the same decree of predestination, immaculate in her conception, a virgin and violent in her divine motherhood, the wholehearted companion of the divine redeemer who won complete victory over sin and its consequences, gained at last the supreme crown of her privileges to be preserved immune from the corruption of the tomb. And like her son, whose death has been conquered, be carried up body and soul to the exalted glory of heaven, there to sit in splendor at the right hand of her son, the immortal king of the ages.